everybody welcome back today we are visiting mr. Scott Woods who has a beautiful layout very very you'll notice very uh, it's he, he's a steel steel mill modeler has built some fantastic versions of steel mills and the industrial grittiness uh, therein beautiful beautiful work so what we're gonna do uh, Scott doesn't have a name for the layout However, it runs roughly the Bessemer route from Conneaut, Ohio, down to North Bessemer. So we're going to have Scott give us a tour, the typical walking tour. We're starting here in, at, the, at the docks in Conneaut. So I'm going to shut up, and I'm going to let Scott take over, and we'll walk around the layout. He'll point things out, and then uh, I'll go back and come back and get some more detailed photos, because you're, you're going to want to see some of these uh, industries and scenes in much more detail so I'll grab those maybe we'll get lucky and see a train or two run as well and then uh, again as usual we'll finish off with a a nice photo collage that will showcase Scott Scott's uh, awesome craftsmanship this is a beautiful beautiful layout you're really gonna enjoy it so without further ado I'm gonna let mr. Scott Woods start the tour thank you Rob welcome everybody to my layout uh, the layout is is two decks the upper deck is primarily the Bessemer, the lower deck is primarily Union and Steel Mills, but I do have one element on the lower of the Bessemer, and that's this big area where we're going to start. This is the ore docks and coal docks up at Conneaut, Ohio. Uh, U.S. Steel had built this completely integrated system, or Andrew Carnegie did, in the 1890s. He had, had the, uh, the ore mines up in Mesabi, had the Duluth Mesabi and Iron Range, mm -hmm. had the docks in Duluth, had the steamship lines across the lakes. The ore would come to the docks at Conneaut on ships like this and be unloaded by Hewlett's. Uh, the ship that I built is the William Irvin, which was the flagship for U.S. Steel. It's a 610-foot boat. Uh, about 14,000 ton capacity. And it is a boat, not a ship, correct? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah the, the lake boats, boats are called the boats. The boats were boats. <laughs> so I, I wanted to build something that they that they actually owned and, and called on Conneaut, and the William Irvin did that. And this boat is preserved as a museum. It's up in Duluth in the harbor. You can take a tour of it. You can walk the length of the hold. Quite an interesting mm. place to visit. Now, Scott, this is scratch built, correct? This is scratch built from mm -hmm. uh, the, the hull is wood. The uh, superstructure is all styrene. Uh, the decks all have interiors. Let me see if I can show that here. And uh, the middle of the the uh, the bridge in the middle deck is lighted, so you can see something in there. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah I, Okay. If you look down here, there's actually two boats in the harbor and four Hewlett's. <laughs> yep. Yeah, so that's, that, so that's uh, again, some of uh, Scott's craftsmanship there. That is actually the same boat, but if you notice, properly displayed on the stern is another ship. So that's pretty clever. So I had. Had to do it all backwards when you were... <laughs> yeah, the other ship is the Albert Gary. He was the first president of U.S. Steel. And then William Irvin, he was president in the uh, mid-30s. Okay. Conneaut ships a lot of iron ore, but they also used to ship a lot of, or bring a lot of coal by boat into Conneaut. Excuse me. They bring it in by train and ship it out by boat. So there's a huge coal receiving area back there. Unfortunately, they don't ship any coal today, but maybe someday that'll come back. So that big green structure in the back is uh, is called a rotary reclaimer, scratch built. Uh, they would unload the coal cars, stack the coal up. They had a half mile long pile of coal there at one time. And then the reclaimer would come along and dig it up, put it on those gray conveyors and bring it out to the ship. Uh, a system of conveyors would come all the way to the ship. The boat. Mm, the boat. Uh, 
and it would also come that they have two huge steel silos that were built in 1967 by Chicago Bridge and Iron which is the company that I worked for so you're gonna see lots of steel plate structures on the layout definitely an influence on the layout isn't we it? have <laughs> lots of, we will never run out of gas or water or oil we have yeah. tanks everywhere <laughs> we have refinery vessels elevated water towers we built blast furnaces, we built basic oxygen furnaces, nuclear reactors, wow, nuclear yeah. containment vessels all over the world. So I got lots of construction going on down here, lots of heavy industry. And then there's a small engine house at the end of Conneaut. So during an operating session, this is where the where the ore trains would start heading for Pittsburgh. And since we're over at this end of the layout, we might as well jump up okay. and go to the far end of the layout, <laughs> which is two feet above the near end. <coughs> now we're coming back right above Conneaut. Yep. All of that iron ore leaving Conneaut is eventually headed to the blast furnace back here. Uh, iron ore gets delivered, limestone, coke, it all goes up here into the blast furnace. From the other side, there's a a skip that comes up the back and dumps everything into the furnace. Uh, there's hot air blowing through there. Once you fire a furnace up, it would run three to five years non-stop. That's called a campaign. Hmm. Um, about every four hours, it, it's full all the way of those materials burning and melting and the molten materials flow into the bottom of the furnace down to the hearth. About every four hours they would tap a hole in the side and drain the molten slag off the top, the lighter slag, and that would come off into these slag cars here, slag pots. And then once the slag was removed, you would tap another hole down lower and that metal hot molten iron would flow out. Uh, you may not be high enough to see it, Rob, but there's, there's runners in the floor with molten iron running through them and pouring into hot metal cars. Okay. <laughs> so when we get around the other side you'll be able to see the okay, hot metal good. cars. Yeah. yeah, that's cool. Um, yeah. That hot metal is molten, molten iron and it's going to get taken to some type of furnace to be transformed into steel. In the early days it would have gone to a Bessemer converter. Later days it went to an open hearth furnace. Today it goes to a basic oxygen furnace and that's what I've modeled on the other side of the room. Since CB and I built a lot of BOFs, okay. I had to have a couple of them over there. <laughs> this was the first steel mill that I built 20 years ago, back when I didn't know a thing about steel mills. And it turns out there's a lot of things wrong in there. So I've taken about half of the equipment out already, and buildings and processes that don't belong. Next winter I'm going to take the whole thing out and redo it. But I've taken the half that I've taken out, I've moved down to the lower levels and put them in the proper locations. So that was Homestead Steel originally in Pittsburgh. When it gets rebuilt, it's going to be Edgar Thompson Steel, which still exists down in Braddock. It's the last two blast furnaces in Pennsylvania. Operational? Is yep. that okay? Yeah. They're still running. Hmm. And I think there used to be 75 or so in the state. Now there's two left. Two. Wow. <laughs> so that's that's the the far end of the the operation as far as the iron ore goes. Okay. Uh, from the blast furnace, there's a lot of con additional <laughs> steel making operations here. Yep. But rather than try to see them in order, do you want to see them just where yeah, we're standing? We're, yeah, we'll, we're going to swing okay. over to this side of the aisle here and then. On this side of the aisle, then, is uh, Pittsburgh Station. Most of what I modeled is roughly the 1850s, but I'm not too strict about that. When it came to Pittsburgh Terminal, I, I liked old Victorian scenes and so I built it as a Victorian scene. Uh, so it's totally the wrong time period for the rest of the layout, but <laughs> I like it. It looks good. Yeah, it really is good. Yeah. It used to have an operating trolley, but at some point I got all these vehicles for a parade and I liked them better, so, so they're, now we have a parade. They're in the tracks, there. okay, yeah, yeah. And running under Pittsburgh Terminal, there's eight tracks. They're mostly trains that would have called on Pittsburgh. 
The Illinois Central, I don't think, ever did, but... Yeah, it's a nice looking train, though. We lived two places in Illinois for a number of years, go, yeah. right on the IC tracks. Okay. So yeah. I had yeah. to have some IC Perfect. equipment running. Yeah. yeah. But uh, there's now, B and O and Pensy. Does the passenger track they stub in back there? They all stub in back at the end of this. Okay. Yep. Gotcha. Trying to move slowly here, so I don't. <laughs> and. Various little downtown scenes, nowhere in particular. It's a little bit, a little bit reflective of Greenville, the town we're in. Um, but I wasn't trying to model Greenville particularly. Right. Yeah. Except right beside you is Greenville Steel Car. Oh, let me go back this way. Okay. Which was a large rail car building business here for oh about seventy years. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah. From around 19, uh, the early 1900s till 1980, about 80 years. One of the larger car manufacturers, they had 1,000 to 1,500 people working there at any given time. I wanted to model that because it, it gave me a great place. All my equipment is weathered, but I had a whole lot of cars that really don't belong on the Bessemer. <laughs> things I collected all over the country. Sure, yeah. So I could put brand new cars from all over the country coming out of steel car and they looked okay there. Yep, makes sense. <coughs> nice. We moved a bunch of times, well, 14 times with CB and I, so I collected stuff all over the country from, from the various were, areas. Yeah, yep. Okay. And we'll hop up there. And, okay, come down yep. a level. So we're going to come down a level here, so. Now we're back to just just below Pittsburgh Station. Uh, the lower level is all Duquesne, either the steel mill at Duquesne or various facilities around Duquesne. Here's the uh, there's a little engine shop down there on the Union Railroad. And then as we come around the corner here. In the Munhall area, just, just next, That's just, cool. yeah, right next to the Homestead Steel Mill was Munhall, and this is what they called Central Wharf. Whenever the, uh, whenever U.S. Steel was going to ship steel by barge, they would send, send it by rail to the, to the Central Wharf, a little <laughs> yard here. Uh, they had a crane that looked just like this, loading the steel on the barges. And then it would go down the Ohio, the Mississippi, wherever they needed to ship it by river. Now you had mentioned, Scott, that a lot or almost all these structures here are scratch built. Most everything is. This this was the old Walters Ore Bridge to start with. I had to modify it quite a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, but everything else down here is scratch built. Okay, yeah. Okay. Including the barges. Yep. The buildings and handling equipment. So this is the steel dock, and then if you come up the Mon River, this is the Mon River right in front of us, you come up the river another half mile, you get to the Duquesne Coal Wharf, which is still there today. Almost all of the coal shipped on the Bessemer since the mid-70s all came out of the Coal Wharf at Duquesne. All of the mines on the Bessemer shut down in the mid-70s or so with the Clean Air Act. Mm -hmm. And all the high sulfur coal in those mines was no longer usable. But this coal would come by barge from West Virginia and southwest Pennsylvania, come down the Mon. And at the coal wharf, they would unload it <coughs> uh, in the 50s and 60s, they had a lattice boom crane for unloading into this hopper, and then that would unload it into the Bessemer hoppers. Mm -hmm. Uh, a little later, they built this continuous bucket, or continuous chain bucket unloader, which is still there today, still operable. Uh, this whole bridge right here floats up and down as the river raises and lowers. Uh, the head range of the Mon River is actually 26 feet at this location, so this has to float up and down on this counterweight. These two trolleys move in and out, move the buckets in and out, depending on the width of the barge. Yeah, that's cool. And then the coal comes up by conveyor and 
eventually gets loaded on the cars. This facility is still being used a little bit today to load out some coal, I think on NS. Mm -hmm. But the Bessemer hasn't hauled any for a few years. Hopefully it'll come back. Very nice. Now, uh, you know, Bill Schaff is with me today, and he's already given Scott a hard time because he says that he should have made the river, you know, adjustable <laughs> so we could actually have this float up and down. So, so yeah, we're a little upset with Scott for not modeling that part of next it. Year, we'll next year, Bill. Maybe next year. Because this is all scratch built, right? Everything all is scratch, scratch built. built yep. uh, about 1,500 pieces in that. Beautiful. I think if I'd have known that up front, I wouldn't have built it. Yeah. <laughs> That was a challenge, but a fun one. I really enjoyed that it. That is beautiful, though. Very nice. Yeah, definitely get some detailed shots of that. All right. And you can't tell from right here, but there's a track right here, which is my my main steel track. This loops the entire basement and ties into every steel mill operation. Hmm. So a crew can be running on the main line and dropping off and picking up at every location. This whole lower level right here, Duquesne, is a... A separate location a crew can be can work the entire length of Duquesne without interfering with the main line so I can have six six or seven crews operating independent even wow. though it's not DCC it's just it's a straight it's a DC, DC layout yeah. but lots of different areas you can operate yeah independently cool. yeah then coming up from uh, from the coal docks we get into the Duquesne area uh, the Duquesne steel mill did have an electric arc furnace. Wow, that's so cool. There's the furnace in there. Yeah. Uh, okay, so, I, so I can kind of sneak in there. An electric arc furnace, you're you're not using pig iron anymore. You're you're melting scrap steel and turning it back into molten steel. Though some mills did bring hot iron into the the uh, hmm. electric arc. So I have a track back here to bring hot metal in just because I like moving the hot metal cars. Once you pour the molten steel here, it doesn't need to go to any further furnaces, so uh, it can go into a teeming ladle and, and make an ingot, or it can roll into the next building, which is the bar mill, hmm. and start to get rolled into whatever shapes that mill rolls. Cool. Next thing we come to is the Duquesne Classification Yard, which is still in business today. If you drive down, I forget what road it is, 837 maybe, through Duquesne, you go right over top of the class yard. Hmm. There's a walkway you can walk across and watch all this action. There's, I don't know, 10, 15 tracks still there. Really? And this uh, is the Union Railroad. The Union Railroad. Railroad. Union Railroad, okay, yep. Uh, it's right across the river from Edgar Thompson. It's, it's just short distance from there. Uh, Irvin plant and a few miles down the river to Clareton, so it's it's the main collection point for all those mills. And okay, you'll see lots of action there on the Union. I'd heard the Union isn't very rail fan friendly. Is that true? They're not. Okay. <laughs> uh, I've never gotten chased away, but I know a lot of people have. And then we're going to right above it. This is the other end of. The Greenville uh, Car Company. Steel Car Company. Yeah. So we're walking down this aisle. At the end of the class yard, there's a duck under here that takes you back to the pig casting plant. Duquesne had a pig caster. Most steel mills had a pig caster, primarily to deal with, uh, to allow them to smooth out the flow of molten iron coming out of the blast furnace. The blast furnace had to run continually, uh, but some of the downstream operations might have a breakdown. Mm -hmm. You had to have a place to divert the molten iron coming out of the blast furnace. So you could bring molten iron into a uh, Here's a, here's a ladle car down here, dumping molten iron into this tun dish, they called it. The tun dish would dump it into these two endless strings of little molds. Mm -hmm. 
the molds would come up the hill, they go under a water spray, uh, solidifies them a little bit. They're still pretty hot, but <laughs> they get at the end of the chain, they get dumped into a, a trough, they get dumped into a gondola. And you showed us right here, and right? Yeah, it's back over this there way. You got three gondolas of pigs. And lots of places would use those pigs as feedstock for their operations. When we were over at the blast furnace, we saw hot metal, hot metal coming out in these, well, slag coming out on slag pots. These are slag pots. Okay. We'll have that running in a little bit. All that slag would be taken to a dump. The Union Railroad pulled between 400 and 600 car loads a day of slag. Wow. From all the U.S. steel mills over to the dumps. Whew. If you go down to the Mifflin area today, you'll see humongous cliffs mm. of slag that the Century Mall or Century 3 Mall yeah, uh, is actually built on a huge, is it really? uh, okay. a huge yeah. mound of slag. Hmm. Okay. And today they're mining that slag, digging it up and taking it away and reusing it. It's really? It's used as aggregate and concrete and fertilizer and ballast, railroad ballast. And oh, that's the sure yeah. Is the, the Coke plant down at Clareton, PA. Still in business today. It was the largest Coke plant in the world at one time. The, uh, the incoming product here is coal. So you can see back here there's an, there's an inbound coal track. Gets dumped way back there. Conveyors bring the coal up, and eventually it brings it to this coal bunker. Puts it in these Larry cars that travel back and forth the length of the furnaces. Huh. Each of these vertical doors here is a separate furnace. You really? Fill, huh. You fill each one with coal, <coughs> and then you bake it. You don't you don't ignite it, but you bake it with hot air for oh god, eight or ten or twelve hours. It drives out all the volatile organic material and what you're left with is this uh, very light porous coke huh. which is the f it's oh that is light it's a yeah. flammable fuel so this is what goes into the blast furnace huh. all of those volatile fumes coming off they collect them in a byproduct plant and turn them into tars and oils and benzene and naphthene and other things <laughs> lots, of, lots of nasty things, lots of warning signs in a Coke plant. <laughs> so once, once a, a single oven gets baked far enough, this machine opens up one of these doors. On the other side of the Coke battery would be a huge contraption called a pusher. Mm. It opens up that door. A big ram goes through the oven and pushes the Coke out. So there's a vertical wall of red hot coke coming out. Oh, I see. So that's that's a product that's come out of the yeah. This oven. is okay. this is the the hot coke. Yeah, comes into the quench car. Once it gets out in the oxygen, it will start burning and consume itself. Oh, okay. Which you don't want it to do. Mm -hmm. So the quench car comes down here to the quench tower. It dumps ten or fifteen thousand gallons of water on it and quenches it. Okay. And then that quench car goes all the way down to the end of the plant to the the coke wharf. <clears throat> dumps wow. the coke out, gets loaded onto coke hoppers, coke racks. Coke is so light that they make coke racks higher than. Oh, is that why? Okay, okay. Yeah, I've seen hoppers, that, and I never knew why. So you can carry more weight. Okay, yeah. So that coke gets pulled out of Clareton, and it goes to the blast furnaces at Edgar Thompson, or to they ship it to other blast furnaces. Okay, yeah. Very neat. LEDs with orange paint. Hmm. The same LEDs that are over there. You can cut them off. Those same. That is a cool scene here. Now we're coming back to the uh, the Edgar Thompson area, the the basic oxygen furnace. When when the hot metal cars leave the blast furnace, it's molten iron. It has a number of impurities that have to be removed. So at a blast, a basic oxygen furnace, you start with scrap steel. So there's a big scrap yard here. Uh, it gets sorted out into um, containers, buckets. Oh yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. 
this scrap will, will come out of here, it'll go around the corner to Valley Yard, and then it eventually comes back to the BOFs. Well, that's cool. Can you shoot up here for just a second? Right? Absolutely. This is a basic oxygen furnace. Chicago Bridge and Iron built 60 or so of those over the years. Uh, we built, we fabricated them right here in the plant in Greenville hmm. and other places around the country. Cool. And we installed everything we built. So we were in a lot of steel mills building these. <coughs> so I, I scratch built a couple of CBI. Well, naturally. BO, <laughs> naturally. BOFs yeah. are called basic oxygen furnace. Okay, yeah. And the way this works is you bring those buckets of, of scrap metal in, in the back side of the BOF building. You set it up on this uh, scrap charging machine. Okay. And these were built by Pecord on in Newcastle, Pennsylvania Engineering. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, their building just got torn down a couple years ago. But the first, the BOFs rotate forwards and backwards. So you rotate it forward, you dump in a bucket of, of scrap iron first, scrap steel. Then, down on the lower level, you got hot metal cars coming in with molten iron in it. Back here, the cars rotate sideways. They get dumped into a ladle down here in a pit. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. The ladle gets picked up by the crane. Oh, there's the ladle, okay, yeah. Carried through the shop, dumped in on top of the scrap steel. Okay. Then you rotate the furnace back up vertical, bring big oxygen lances down in, and you blow humongous quantities of oxygen, and I couldn't even tell you. Uh, 20,000 cubic feet a minute of oxygen. Wow. You blow that in there for 20 minutes, <laughs> it burns volatile, just extremely uh, volatile down in there. Uh, it burns out all the carbon. So now when you're, when you're done you've got molten steel. Okay. You take some samples, you, you see what the chemistry is, mm -hmm. and then they will have bags of additives up there, different chemicals that they'll throw in. Right. Depending on what kind of grade of steel you're trying to make, you throw in 100 pounds of this and 200 pounds of that. And oh, okay. Yeah. So you're not talking teaspoons, you're talking a lot of... <laughs> you, you look up the cookbook recipe, right. you throw the bags in, and, yeah. and that produces a certain grade of steel. Okay. Now, my BOF building should be three times as deep as this, but the wall's right there, so... <laughs> so in my, my plant, you, uh, you dump that out into a ladle, you carry it down here, and you... Uh, you fill up ingot molds out of that ladle. Oh, I see. Yep. There's yep. a valve in the bottom of the, uh, about in the bottom of the ladle. You fill up those individual molds. Yeah, it'd be a little hard to see. Okay. There's an, oh, there you go. There's an ingot mold. Okay. So you fill that up with molten steel. Okay. Yep. And then let's we can follow that process. Right on. Yep. So we'll skip by this for a minute. The Edgar Thompson plant. Uh, ingot mold buggies have two ingot molds on, or three or four. Molten steel is in there. It starts to solidify. When it reaches a certain point, you bring it down here into the stripper shed. Oh, cool. <laughs> so there's, there's the ingot molds. The stripper crane pulls that outer shell off. And it leaves, oh, well, look at that. leaves yeah. the red hot ingot standing there. Okay. And then as when we go back through, we'll see back in the yard here, there's here's buggies that have had the molds and ingots taken off. Yeah. Uh, so now we've got red hot ingots. You want to process them as quickly as you can before they cool. So now we need to go back to where we started the other corner, huh? Alright, we're gonna pause, go back there. So now the, the red hot ingots are coming back to the slab mill where they're going to be rolled into slabs. Uh, today at Edgar Thompson this would be a continuous caster but before continuous casters it would come into something like this. Uh, the ingots come into the back corner of the building. I don't know if you can see back in there. Yeah I think so. Let me there's, there's a big furnace in the floor. Or, or, I forget what they call them. A reheating furnace. You store the ingots down there, you keep them red hot. 
Okay. And you bring them up one at a time and put them on the rolling tables. You run them through. There should be a series of rolls here, but you know this building should be a half mile long. Right. You know, <laughs> that's how big they were. Yeah. But you you run the ingots through a series of rolls. In this case, we're rolling slabs, so it's a continuous slab coming out of there. Okay. There would be some more machines to cut the slabs up into, or cut that big piece into individual slabs. Mm -hmm. And then down here at the end, there's hot slabs coming out. And after they cool, here's cold slabs in storage. Okay. Wow. And then those slabs would go to other rolling mills to be rolled into plates. Okay. Slab rolling mill just makes slabs. They had other mills that made rounds, billets, um, different different shapes, which would then roll into different structural shapes, angles and beams and channels. So a lot of rolling mills wow. were used necessary in the steel mills. Okay, I didn't realize it was such an evolved process. Now, Scott, all this specialized the ingot cars and the hot this car and the hot that. Is that all scratch built stuff? Or where do you find No, that the rolling stuff? stock is all available through a, a number of suppliers. Oh, okay. Most of the uh, the smaller accessories, uh, yeah, the, the rolls are available. Oh, okay. But a lot of the stuff like this I just scratch built. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like the, the, the ladles and the buckets, they're all available? I, uh, well, they are. All the minor scratch built. They are scratch built, okay. Yeah. Yep. Just because wow. I like the scratch built things. Sure, sure, yeah. Right behind you, Rob, we'll change pace a minute. <laughs> this is one of the slag dumps on the Union. There was three slag dumps uh, all over in West Mifflin. Okay. The Union Railroad gathered slag from all the different U.S. steel mills, seven or eight mills, and would bring between 400 and 600 carloads a day of slag to, this is Risher Dump. And you dump it down over the hill, and it's a big, spectacular volcano. I've seen a lot some of photographs. Flow. Yeah, okay. Um, as it cools down here, there would be excavators. They had cranes with big electromagnets and big iron balls. They would drop and break the slag up, haul it away, and process it into something. Okay. Uh, as a waste wow. product, the mills were anxious to get rid of it. The Bessemer took hundreds of thousands of carloads over the years and used it as fill. Oh. They built probably some of the biggest fills that any of the railroads ever built because they had free slag. Free slag. <laughs> you know, down at uh, yeah. Bull Run. Okay. They built a fill that I forget. So it's a mile long, but it's something like 130,000 carloads of slag. Wow. Uh, they used tremendous quantities of slag for their fills so they could level out their tracks, run more efficiently. Now, what's, what's a slag mag? Uh, all of these uh, slag loads have... Uh, they're, they're removable. Oh, okay. Okay. They're all, they're, I made them out of plaster and there's a nut inside. So a little can, magnet so you can remove the, you can, out of those, that's pull cool. Pull the slag yeah. out of the slag pot and send it back to the blast furnace. There you go, me. nice, excellent, okay. Okay. This is Valley Yard, which is in, in the Edgar Thompson plant. A uh, little engine shop, big yard. have to pay tribute. To the Bessemer <laughs> superintendent, Marty Magditch. Marty's a lifelong rail fan of the Union and Bessemer. Really? He's taken me out many days rail fanning on the Union. We've covered about every inch of the tracks there. He knows everything about it and knows everybody. And his entire house is a museum of Union and Bessemer memorabilia. Well, that's a good connection to have. Heck yeah. of a nice fella. Yeah. Cool. You know, I got a whole lot of his artwork right around the corner here. Oh, nice. Well, he's a great photographer, so he's he snuck into the Union there shooting, he's shooting, <laughs> shooting pictures. And I even commemorated him up here. He's the 1,500th person on the layout. 1,500th. I started keeping track go. a few years ago how many people I had. And when I got to 1,500, it was time to commemorate Marty. He's, he's immortalized. Awesome. <laughs> he never worked for the railroad, but everybody knows him, and they call him Superintendent Marty. Oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah. He's, he's a heck of a guy. Nice guy. Yeah. If you take a quick shot here, this is all my Marty Magnich gallery. All okay. pictures yeah. he's taken, uh, the clock he made. Nice. He made that. All yeah. places we visited on our rail fan days. Yep. I've learned a whole lot from him. Very nice. That's cool. Let's just mention this real quick since, okay. we're, since we're here. 
I had a bunch of engines that I, I had more than I could fit on the layout. I wanted to store them somewhere where you could see them and, and be able to get them out. And uh, Larry's Truck Electric is an actual place over in McDonald, Ohio. Used to be a U.S. Steel steel mill. Uh, Larry's Truck, I think they started out repairing trucks. They, they at some point switched over to repairing diesels. Mm -hmm. And buying diesels, when the railroads were getting rid of them, Larry would buy them up, refurbish them, uh, lease them out or sell them. And he's mm. still got a huge complex over there today. Uh, I'd guess 100, 150 engines there at any given time. Yeah, now look how big this is. So I thought Larry's Truck Electric would be a good place to store my extra engines. <laughs> and you can awesome. see it's, it's really huge. It's really big because it goes that way and... There you go, look at that. Goes on forever. That's cool. There's about 700 <laughs> engines you can I was going to say, there's about yeah. 700. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, uh, let's look at the back side of the steel mill here. All right. Here quick pause, my, we'll be right back. My blast furnace. But I haven't put lights in it yet, so it doesn't show up very well. Oh, you started? Yeah. Oh, oh I'm sorry, yeah. Yep, yep. Okay, this, this is the... <laughs> The back side of the blast furnace, uh, you might be able to see the, uh, the flowing molten iron coming through the runners in the floor. I started to put uh, all the interior equipment in there, but I haven't put any lights in yet, so it doesn't show very well. But uh, when I rebuild it next winter, we'll have lighting in there. So we'll come back for an, an annual update to yeah. see the, the new steel mill. So the, this is the iron ore coming into the yard. There would be a huge ore yard. Uh, it gets loaded. This overhead crane, bridge crane, loads these skip cars. Okay. Which yeah. takes, the, takes the iron ore to the top of the furnace and the limestone and the coke. But all of this is getting torn out next winter and converted into Edgar Thompson. Wow, that's amazing. When this kit first came out, I didn't know much about steel mills. I, I built the entire thing that Walters had and called it Homestead. Well, it turns out Homestead doesn't have any blast furnaces. <laughs> They're across the river at Cary, and it didn't have an electric arc furnace that used to be here, and it didn't have the coke plant that used to be over there. <laughs> so I've, I'm taking that stuff out and I'm going to rebuild it properly. And, but now it's going to become Edgar Thompson to tie in with the rest of my Okay, mill. yeah, yeah. And down at this yeah. end, since I don't want it next to my Greenville shops anymore, there's going to be a backdrop all the way across here with the mirror, the full full width, full height. So instead of two blast furnaces, you'll be looking at yeah, four that's blast furnaces. Yeah, that'll look really cool. Yeah. That should be a pretty nice scene from, oh, man. from the right direction. Right, yeah. As long as you don't lean over and wow. see your face, you're okay. Yeah. Yeah, you don't want to see my face. That's the one thing you don't want to see. Very nice. Okay, back at Connie out, right? When, when the Hewlett's unload the ore, some of it loads directly into ore cars, but a whole lot of it goes into a, a huge stockpile here. Hmm. Uh, all summer long they build this stockpile up so that when winter comes and the lakes are frozen and you can't get any more ore boats in, then the bridge cranes start digging the ore out of the ore piles, stockpiles, putting them on the uh, okay. on the jennies and sending them south to Pittsburgh. Yeah. So it's a it's a year round operation, but you only got boats six, seven, eight months of the year. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> One of the interesting things that my son and I started doing decades ago, as we traveled around the country and visited different railroad places, is we always collected things we could use on the layout. Mainly minerals, coke and coal and iron ore and slag and, and ashes and wood and all sorts of stuff. And there's about a hundred things around the layout. There's little signs on the fascia and, and there's things from all over the country that we collected. One of the ones that I like most of all is the coal. All of the, all of the coal that's being carried by the Bessemer hoppers comes from the Pardo Mine. Uh, Pardo Mine is just 
15 miles from here. It opened in 1860, I'm call it 1865, I think. Okay. Um, they built a little railroad in 1868, which brought the coal from Pardo up to almost to Greenville, a little town of Shenango. And that original railroad was the Shenango and Allegheny. Yeah, okay. Eventually, the Shenango and Allegheny grew into the Bessemer. So, I this mine closed about 1920, but I found it on the satellite. I went out in the woods and found the old foundations, found a lot of coal on the ground. So I collected a bucket of Pardo coal and crushed it up and sifted it. <laughs> so all of my coal, all of my Bessemer hoppers are carrying removable loads of Bessemer Pardo coal. That's cool. So we can send, you know, we, we leave the Pardo mine with full cars. Yeah. We deliver the coal down to Conneaut, take the loads out and send the empties back. So we're hauling genuine Pardo coal. Look at that. Not many guys can say that they're hauling genuine, genuine, genuine coal for the railroad they're operating. <laughs> I have about 20 different <clears throat> railroads represented here in hopper cars. Mm -hmm. And with all of our moves, I collected coal from those 20 railroads. Did you really? Okay. So every car is carrying, every hopper is carrying coal from its home railroad. Wow. All the way out to uh, one Southern Pacific car. I got some SP coal. <laughs> That's dedication, Scott. Likewise, <laughs> all the iron ore is is uh, genuine iron ore from the Masabi Range. During during uh, World War One and Two, U.S. Steel built huge ore piles up in Albion, stockpiles. Mm -hmm. They removed them after the war, but there's still a residue of ore up there in the ground. And you can see it on satellites, you can see red smudges here and there. So I went out in the woods, found some old Masabi, the best of them called it mud ore because it was so sticky. But I brought home a bucket of mud ore and dried it and sifted it. So all of my Jennies are carrying mud ore. And all of my, my ore stockpiles at Conneaut. Yeah, and at the steel mill, yep. and in the ore boat, in the boat, yep. that's all genuine Masabi that's ore, the, the real stuff. Yeah, <laughs> and it doesn't look much different than what you could buy in the store, but I like having the story to tell, and I like. Well, that's cool. That's like I like knowing the real it came stuff. from the right place, and yeah. we're, we're hauling the right stuff. Yep. So I've got a whole lot of things around the layout like that. My steel mill is covered in coke that I I collected from various um, steel mills that I worked in over the years. <laughs> I have coke and iron ore and slag and crumbled up rust off of various, you know, all my hot metal cars are covered with fine rust that I took off of a hot metal car somewhere. Now, do you ever get any funny looks, Scott, when you're walking around a plant, walking out with buckets of slag, like, why are you taking that stuff? And <laughs> I got a private tour of the Age of Steam Roundhouse early this year over in Sugar Creek, Ohio. Yeah. Yeah. And when we came out, I looked in one of the dumpsters, and there was a whole pile of shavings. They'd been machined in their steam engine wheels. Yeah. And the owner's son and the designer of the plant had taken us on a tour. And I said, can I climb into your dumpster and get some shavings? And I explained why, and yes, I did get a funny look. But you got them. Apparently, they don't get that request every day. That's probably not a, uh, a normal request. So I've got a lot of steam engine shavings now that I yeah. can put in yeah. my steel mill, awesome. in my scrap yards. So. We try to collect stuff everywhere we go. Yeah. All right. So that kind of wraps up the steel part of the layout. I think it correct? does. All right. Now we covered Pittsburgh, which is over here to our left. We covered the Pittsburgh. Do you want to do a quick buzz around the upper layout? Sure. Is that? Okay. Might as well right here and. Yep. Come back on this side of the aisle. Okay. This is one of those things that doesn't fit in the right geographic location. It's beautiful though. But Man. before I was. Before I was modeling the Bessemer, I just built this big engine complex. <laughs> now it's the Bessemer shops in Greenville. Okay, yeah. And it does represent pretty closely what is there today, or what was there. Over there is the big roundhouse and turntable for the steam side. Mm -hmm. Over to your right is the diesel side. Uh, there's machine shops out there and lube shops. And uh, a big uh, storeroom building in the middle. Wow. The three tracks in the middle are the inbound track and the service track and the ready track. Uh, this whole area can be operated independently from the rest of the layout. Mm. So during an operating session, some hosters can can be working this whole area. Yep. Um, 
Here's another one of the CBNI projects. We oh, built a lot cool. of elevated water towers. Okay, yeah. We had our own design of derricks that we designed and built. So that's how they build them from the inside. That's like how that. you build an elevated water tower. Oh, interesting. Yeah. We built thousands of those all over the country and, mm -hmm. and overseas. Here's one of the newer additions. The Bessemer had a McKean car, a self propelled passenger car, in, I forget, 1816, I think. Uh, they used it up at, uh, golly, where did they use it? Up in Conneaut, from Conneaut to Albion for a while. Uh, they used it on the Meadville branch, I think, and down on the Hilliards coal branch. Mm. And it turned out it wasn't very, wasn't very good. It was, it was underpowered. Okay. <laughs> uh, they used it for a couple years. They parked it in Greenville. And I've got one picture showing that they, they used the car body as a shed for a number of years. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Eventually scrapped it. Mm. But I, uh, I found a, a shell for the McKean body. Had to build the rest of it in the interior and the drive. But it does run. It runs. Cool. I'm huh. still looking for somebody to make me one decal to put on here. It's hard to find somebody that will print one white decal for you. Just one thing, right? Yeah. In white, yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Uh, okay. If you go on down just a little further, All right. on the other side it. of the furnace, Coming I did down. use every inch of space, so the furnace is Certainly, right. yeah, you did, yeah. The furnace is enclosed. This is the erecting hall, which still stands in Greenville today. Wow. It was the steam engine erecting hall at one time. It mm. was 27 bay. It is 20, the building is 27 bays. I got room for eight. Yep. There's a transfer table down there today that I think is uh, 600 or so feet long. Wow. So I got an operating transfer table that'll nice. service the eight bays. Okay, cool. Very impressive. And the Bessemer Rec Train sits right there. It used to sit right down by the station or by the uh, roundhouse. Okay. So that's my Bessemer complex, shop complex. Mm -hmm. I see Thomas in there. When we first started, we bought <laughs> we bought equipment from all over the place that really didn't belong and it right, yeah. didn't look right on the layout. Yeah. So we built a big railroad museum to put all the oddball equipment in. Okay, yeah. And uh, it goes all the way down to that covered bridge. That's all the oddball stuff in the museum. Okay, yeah. I'll For years, we called that the Strasburg Museum. Yeah, yeah. But we came to Greenville and I got involved with the Greenville Railroad Park and. I've been president of it for 12 years now, so this is now the Greenville Railroad Park. Greenville Park, okay. The future yeah. version. Yeah. <coughs> uh, we found we could use that museum concept in other areas. Here's a, we had a real nice wooden oil well. No good way to use it. Yep. So this is the Drake's Oil oh, Museum okay. up yeah. in Titusville. Yep. Where oil cool. was first discovered. Yep. Um, and it's got a bunch of old oil field equipment on display. Around the corner is the uh, the big yard that still exists on the Bessemer down at Shenango. Oh, yeah, yeah. This was the terminus of the original railroad. When they built the Shenango and Allegheny, it came from the mine at Pardo up to Shenango. Back in those days, the 1860s, um, the Erie Canal went right through there. Hmm. So the Erie Canal extension. Uh, so the, the Shenango and Allegheny was bringing coal up to the canal boats. The Erie Railroad's predecessor went through there, the Allegheny and Great Western. Okay. Uh, yep. The Pennsylvania Railroad's predecessor went through there, the Erie and Pittsburgh. Erie Pittsburgh, yeah. So three railroads in, in the canal all met at Shenango <laughs> and interchanged freight, a lot of coal and oil. Yeah. Cool. So this is my Shenango yard. Nice. Keep going this way. Continue on around in this All level. Right. Yep. Continuing here on the upper level. A little river scene right there just because I, I like to put scenic little things in the corners. Yep. Detailed little scenes. We're having a good old time down there. Nice. Shenango River going past. Yep. The town of Shenango, the yard of Shenango. Uh, the canal did go through Greenville. It was oh, one of the yeah. It was one of the big reasons for Greenville's growth in the 1840s when the okay. canal arrived here. Yeah. Um, you know, it was gone by the 1880s, but I wanted to include a little segment of canal here, and I like the lock, so I I built a lock and a a, a boat of coal coming through, that a barge of neat. coal coming yeah. through. 
just lower this here so people can see. Look at that. <laughs> so that doesn't really fit either, but I guess I could call that a museum segment there. I might need to change the name on yeah. it. There is a very nice canal museum in Greenville, and it sits right where one of the locks was. If they could have this lock at their museum today, they'd be really that'd, pleased. That'd be, that would be yeah. something. Yeah, that's cool. Very nice. Around the corner here is the Pardo Mine. Ah! Where the Bessemer started. With real Pardo coal. Well, it's all Pardo coal. I've never found a picture of the mine proper, so we don't oh, know okay. what it looked like. All right. But my son built this, oh golly, 20 years ago, one of his first scratch building projects. Nice. So we call that the Pardo Mine, and all the coal originates there. Here's a big old block of coal that last time I was down at Pardo, I brought that back with me. So to make it, you would actually take that and crush it? Well, if you're going to do that to, for the cars? I have with a lot of the other coal, but this one I'm going to put stairway up the side and a picnic table up top and make this oh, their, nice. their lunch area. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> just because I like a few little eccentric things. Sure, around. sure, yeah. And this Which is, the other is why side you would have seen kangaroos if you look close at some areas. Well, I might find them when I wander around. The Bessemer did <laughs> have one covered bridge at one time. So that covered bridge has been preserved and moved to the railroad park here in Greenville. Nice. And this is the other side of the park then. This is, this is the rest of the Greenville yeah, Park. Yep, yep. There is a, a loop of N scale track in there that used to operate. Got a GG1 in there. Nice. A little bit of everything. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of stuff that doesn't belong. Well, it's a museum, so, you know. Very nice. That's cool. There is a scene to your right that you may or may not want to include. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Marty's Big Bear Naturalist Resort. A Naturalist Resort. Yeah. Well, maybe I can put a disclaimer up first, so. I'm going to pause here, then I'll flash a disclaimer. <laughs> Don't worry, it's all just plastic. It's not a nudist colony, it's no, an high class naturalist resort. Right, right. With interchangeable nameplates depending on who's coming to visit. Okay. <laughs> so pe various people can be honored. Yep. Oh, I see. Gotcha, gotcha. Very nice. There is the required volleyball game going on in the back. <laughs> So that's. I'm do a quick. So <laughs> I had to build this taser some years ago because I had uh, I had a lot of visitors coming who were not following the proper rules, <laughs> and uh, since I put this in, it's it's uh, smooth things out. The a infractions lot. have gone away. Yeah. Huh? Nice, nice. Unauthorized touching and pointing out of errors has gone way down. Yeah, I was gonna say that's a pretty that's that's pretty pricey. So between those two, yeah. That, yeah, you don't want to do that. All right. There's there's a number of errors that can be pointed out here. <laughs> quite willing to do that. So this is one of your. This is a gigantic staging yard down here. <coughs> this is uh, an unscenic staging yard. Sixteen mm -hmm. tracks. And I don't think we talked on the other end about the uh, stub switch, did we? Not yet. While we did. We were, yeah, we'll, 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 we'll mention that. Yep. Yep. But if you come down to this end, Rob, all the signs, this is the thing that I like most about this. This is all staging, ah, uh, yes. yeah. dimly lit intentionally. It's going to be un, unfinished, un, unscenic. But I built a whole lot of little signs. So these tracks can represent any city I want, any industry I want. Here's one for Chicago. Um, here's one for the Saxonburg Sintering Plant. So I got an Amtrak train sitting here on the Chicago track, <laughs> which does not belong in the Bessemer, but Amtrak does run into Pittsburgh. Yeah. So yeah. during an operating session, we can somebody can pull an Amtrak train out of Chicago, bring it into Pittsburgh. Yep. Yeah. Some future session, they can pull the train from Pittsburgh back to Chicago, and wherever there's an empty track, I'll put the sign there. So they know where to go. Um, Perfect. I've yeah. got. Oh, look at this. <laughs> I got all sorts of industries and towns that I can represent. So these cover all the various types of rolling stock that I have. Yep. So I can send stuff anywhere I want or pick it up from anywhere. We can run out to Harrisburg. Nice. Westinghouse. Yeah. 
Yeah. Cool. That that adds a lot of flexibility to the operating session. Oh yeah, yeah. And yeah. it justifies a lot of the oddball equipment that doesn't really sure. belong on the Bessemer, but stuff I like. Yeah. And I see one for Wallace Junction, right? Stop. Up by me. Up by your back here. Beautiful. Right? Yep. Let's see. Behind you is another pretty unique area. Give me this spinner on here. Holy moly. <laughs> I like building scenery. And, and uh, I was always intrigued with building Conneaut Lake Park. The Bessemer Railroad actually owned Conneaut Lake Park for 10 years. They did. I think 1895 to 1905. Okay. Right around there. Uh, many of the amusement parks in their early days were owned by railroads or trolley car companies. Huh. Before there was cars to take you there, the you know the trolley car companies sure. would buy a park or right, build a park, right. lay tracks to it, and then they had the monopoly on. And if you wanted to go, you're going on them. Getting people there. Yeah. So I got Conneaut Lake Park. <laughs> um, it's not a real close replica of what was actually at the park, but it was things that I liked. Yeah. Scenes that I liked from other parks. That rocket ship ride up ahead of you did actually exist at the park. I had to scratch build that. Okay, that, yeah, that's cool. It uh, it ran a lot faster and the rockets went out a lot farther. Right. <laughs> but Crank they, it up! If they do that here, they crash into things. <laughs> and there was a Ferris wheel at Conneaut, but not quite that big. Is that a, uh, a kit for a Yeah, Ferris that was wheel? a, a Faller kit. Faller, okay. Faller yeah. and Kibri, I would highly recommend their kits. They're they make gorgeous structures, uh -huh. okay. and everything fits together perfectly. Really? Okay. And then next to it is another odd oddity for Conneaut Lake Park, the, the Swiss Family Robinson Treehouse. Oh, Disney. yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, I love that thing when we were down there, so. Steps. <laughs> we have to have Swiss Family Robinson there. That is cool. <laughs> and I had a bunch of ship parts off an old plastic sailing ship. Yeah. So I salvaged the parts, just like... They did in the movie, and, yeah. and yeah. so there's a figurehead up there on the top deck. Yeah. Ship's lanterns nice. hanging in the yeah. trees. Yeah. Cool. And then here's a, a big mountainside fantasy golf course <laughs> to separate the uh, the amusement park from the yeah. Yeah. from the industry. Okay. There's about seven holes of golf in there. Good enough. Good enough. Yeah. Then we get back into the industrial area. Most steel mills had water treatment plants, or they all had water treatment plants. And CBI built a lot of tanks and vessels for water treatment. Okay. This was one called a Claricone and a Clarifier. Uh, the cooling water coming off the rolling mills would have a lot of s scale in it. Ah, yes. Okay. And you had to yeah. separate it out, just let gravity separate it out in settling tanks. Okay, okay. And then you collect the, collect the sludge and process it and let the water go back to the river. So I had a water treatment plant. Yeah. Wow. And even though the Bessemer didn't have any refineries, I had to have a refinery since that's where <laughs> I spent half my career. Step up here. So if you look down at the far end, there's you know, the typical tanks that we built, uh, spheres that we built. We built about 70% of all the spheres in the world. Wow. I scratch built the four big white ones. How'd you make them? How'd you get them round like that? What, uh, they're giant plastic Christmas balls. Are they really? Yeah. <laughs> okay. And then the red one started out as a Christmas ball. I cut it into pieces and reassembled it as a tank under construction. Okay. Yeah. Sphere under construction. Yeah. <laughs> uh, awesome. My current project is right here in front of you, Rob. These four giant vessels. That's the the heart of any refinery. Is a it's called a fluidized catalytic cracking unit. Okay. That's where the, uh, the oil comes in and it gets heated up and vaporized. It goes over to that brown vessel on the left, the fraction fractionator, and it gets condensed back out into the various fractions. Uh, gasoline, kerosene, oh, okay. um, naphtha, uh, different oils. So I'm going to have all four vessels under construction, uh, so they'll have a lot of scaffolding on them yet. And a lot of wow. people and construction equipment. <laughs> yeah. uh, this crane is lifting this great big head that goes on top of that vessel. That's the last major piece of steel going on, and then there'll be lots of detail added later. Wow, yeah. This head sits up here. Yeah. These big cylinders are called cyclones. They hang down inside the 
the regenerator vessel. And then I've got a great big shop built vessel coming out of Chicago Bridge and Iron here in Greenville. Oh, yeah. Three, cool. three Erie flat cars. Uh, we shipped a lot of vessels out of Greenville on the Erie. I did actually finish scenicing the layout a few months ago, 100% scenic, but I got a whole lot of projects like this, things that I want to squeeze into other, right, <laughs> squeeze into finished areas. Yeah. So I'll be quite a few years adding more detail. Yeah. Like I say, it's, the layout's never really no. done. And that whole giant FCC unit doesn't add a thing to railroad operations, but I just like building the, you just like the building scenes it. and the yeah. detail and the yeah. structures. And, so I'll something. keep busy quite a few years building more stuff. Nice, very nice. All right. Uh, we still got one area around the side. We okay, I'm gonna do a quick pause and go to one more area. Baltimore, right outside the big hall where they have the yeah. show. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, had to modify my ceiling to get that one in. I was gonna say, it looks like you had to go up a little bit. We don't yeah. mind doing things like that. <laughs> now it's sticking. Comes down better than it goes up. Now is that a kit or you scratch that? That's a, a faller kit. It is. Okay. <laughs> Did that come with the sound unit? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Back on the upper level, the the Bessemer level. This corner is Greenville. There's a a tiny representation of the CB&I Greenville plant there. Steel plate fabricators. Uh, there's a little station, not very similar to the Bessemer station in Greenville, but <laughs> it's the one I had. So yeah, yep. That's the Bessemer station. Uh, right next to the station, there used to be Britain's Coal Company, a home coal delivery. So I got a coal plant in here. And most of the rest of this doesn't represent anything prototypical, just little things I liked. Things you like, little scenes you wanted to include. Yeah. There is a central park in Greenville. It used to have a fountain like that, so I, I wanted a little central park area. Mm -hmm. When we were out in Illinois, I saw a lot of steam tractors. Really liked them, so I added a few of them to the park. <laughs> Just north of Greenville is the town of Osgood. Yeah. Uh, I've got Osgood Yard right behind us. So this is my little Osgood area. It's got some uh, a lot of Amish folks there. There's some Amish sawmills and farms. So I hmm. put in the sawmill and the farm. How many chickens and roosters you got? Plenty of chickens. <laughs> and this yard then, it is used to be a big yard up at Osgood. Today there's a couple tracks left. So I've got my two main lines through the middle of Osgood and then three tracks on either side. Okay. The Bessemer did haul the Ringling Brothers Circus a time or two over the years. Mm -hmm. And I started collecting circus cars when we were out in Chicago area. Lots of circus equipment out there. Okay. Most of the circuses wintered up in the ah. Caribou, Wisconsin area. Yeah. Okay. So lots of circus motors out there, and I really got hooked on that. So I've got a. Most usually my circus train lives up here in in the storage. Oh, so this is more up here, yeah, yeah. But I brought two tracks down just to just to add a little splash of color today. Nice. One of our railroad park members used to be the head of security on the Bessemer, and he was telling me a couple weeks ago about. Moving the moving the Ringling train sometime in the fifties, Ringling uh -huh. Brothers. Yeah, um, from Erie down through Greenville down to Shenango. One of the one of the minerals I picked up over the years when I was touring the, uh, the Ringling Brothers Museum up in Baraboo. Yeah, and the there was I think five brothers, but the main guy was I think John Ringling had a big mansion in town, a stone mansion, and we walked around the outside and the stone was crumbling quite a bit. So I picked up a, a handful of this brown 
powder off of his house. Yeah. So all of the all of the cars are now weathered with stone off of, of John Ringling's house. Actual Ringling weathering. Yep. <laughs> he's he's still in the circus business. So this this uh, circus train is circa 1950s. I Ish. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> It looks great. This is really I, cool. I like the nice. circus stuff, but I didn't learn very much about the Okay, no, that's of it. fine. Cool. And a little lake scene. Spent a lot of time in Boy Scouts growing up. We used to build monkey bridges. Yeah. Yep. So that was one of the things I had to have on here. Mm, nice. Well, I see. Now we're back to Greenville. Got it. Just okay. Various yeah. nondescript buildings. Yeah. This this I scratch built. It's it's a replica of the house I grew up in here in Greenville. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Which does have an interior in it. Didn't build the furniture, but cool. Nice. Yeah. It's a fun little project. And I think, oh no, right behind you, we missed the uh, the Helix. Oh yeah, you gotta show, I'm gonna do a pause and turn around here. To get from the lower level to the upper level is about 18 inches. So there's a Helix here, three and a quarter turns. Uh, just behind the Helix, you can see the Conneaut docks. Yep. And then immediately behind Rob is the, the other end of the Bessemer, the North Bessemer Yard. Yep. So you can leave from either end of the Bessemer, north or south end, Come to the helix, you come up to the top level, you make several laps around the Bessemer, you go to the different yards, yeah. the shops, you do all your work. Um, Just curious, where does the helix come out on the top level? The helix goes, this track goes all the way under the steel mill, all the way under Conneaut Lake Park. Yep. And there's a tunnel portal right at the at the end of Conneaut Lake Park. It pops okay. out there. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. And it comes in here. Comes in right here. Right here is where it starts, okay. And these three tracks, one of these feeds the staging yard. The other two is a giant turning loop around the... Oh, okay. It circles the entire staging area. So anything coming down the helix can go around the turning loop and go right back up. Yep. Or it can go to Conneaut, or it can go to staging, or it can go to North Bessemer. Okay, yeah, yeah. Or it can go right there in front of you back to Universal Atlas Cement. Yep, right here. Which was yep. a big... Uh, Big cement plant on the Union Railroad. U.S. Steel built Universal Atlas cement plants at a number of their steel mills, including up in Duluth, as a way to process some of their scrap slag. Ah, okay. They would bring the slag in here and crush it and and use it as a, an aggregate in cement making. Cool. And then the cement would ship out covered hoppers as, in bulk or boxcars in bags. Oh, okay. Cool. Now this is your, let me show them your, your oh, the okay. staging lead here. One of the things I've seen over the years <laughs> at uh, oh, East Broadtop and the Colorado Railroad Museum, they had stub switches, two-way stub switches, three-way stub switches, where the, the stock rails move instead of the point rails mm -hmm. moving. And I was at the Heston Live Steam Museum, Heston, Indiana, uh, big outdoor railroad, their main storage building has, I think, five tracks in it, uh, and they have a, I'll, I'll say, a 30-foot long <laughs> flexible track that swings back and forth and connects up to any of the five tracks, and I like that idea for staging, so I have a, a six-foot long flexible track here <laughs> that lines up with any of my, I got 12 staging tracks on this one, and then 12 more back there on the other side. Yes, yep. yep. And... Originally, I was going to build a, a conventional yard. When I laid it out, when you put 24 switches in, you lose an awful lot of storage <laughs> space. By eliminating all the switches, I gained about 200 cars capacity. Yep. Um, it is cool. And for its intended purpose, uh, this was okay with me. Yeah, if it works. Not very prototypical, but I wanted more capacity. Yeah. All 24 tracks, there's no wiring. Which, whichever track you connect to, mm -hmm. 
now those that track is hot. You can run your train out, no problem. Yeah. Nothing else ever moves accidentally. So that's a cool idea. It looks kind of weird, but it it serves a nice purpose yeah. for me. Hey, if it works, it works. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay. And I think we have now seen everything. All right. So that kind of wraps up the walking tour. What I'll do now is I'm gonna I'm gonna pause, take a little break here from walking around, and then uh, go back and I want to get some definitely get some detailed photographs of some of your stuff and, and some cookies and some cookies. Yeah, and maybe see a train or two. Run. I got three trains ready to run on my three loops. Here we go. All right. So we'll be back shortly. All right. So inside there, that is what's that simulating in there inside there, Scott? Uh, the furnace is being tapped. You're pulling off the hot metal, and the, the uh, molten iron, so there's runners in the floor, channels in the floor that the hot metal runs through, ah. and it comes out over there into those hot metal cars. Into the cars, okay, I see, yep. So there's flashing light strips in the floor that slightly simulate that flowing looks cool. molten iron. Yeah, that's good. Some guys have come up with some much better lighting effects these days that look super realistic. That's cool. So when I rebuild next year, maybe I'll try something different. Awesome. I saw a bunch of up in Coney you know, big blocks of limestone thrown in the water along the water's edge as riprap. And I had a big block of limestone that I collected when we were in Houston. I thought I could saw it up and use it for something. I got the outside of the road, so I'm going to 
Thank you.